coded references like Nostradamus that shows that the royal family of France is descended partly from Sirius and possess superhuman powers. And there are hints that we'll have peace in Europe and apparently in the whole world once these superhuman beings are allowed to rule us again after all the mistakes of the last two centuries are undone and all these democratic follies are put aside and we accept these superhuman beings who have come here just to help us and I say, gee, that, that bullshit sounds familiar where have I heard that before? we've been hearing that since the Stone Age about various types who have a desire to rule oh, we're not humans like you are we're descended from the sun god that's what the, you know, that's what the Aztecs said that's what the Inca said in Peru that's what the Hiro, uh, Hirohito was the last one to claim that and he was buried there God is dead. Ever since Hirohito was buried, we got no more gods on this planet. He was the last one. Well, no, no, no we still had Rajanish, didn't we? After, after Rajanish was buried, well, suddenly we were left on our own. We've got to figure it out for ourselves now. Well, maybe another god will pop up somewhere. 73. When... Uh, La Russe Fabulous was published, a Swiss journalist named Matthew Pauli published a book called Undercurrents of Political Ambition. And he got interested in the Priory of Sion because he found their newsletter circuit was being distributed through the lodges of the Grand Loge Alpina, the largest Masonic Brotherhood in uh, Switzerland. As a matter of fact, the Grand Loge Alpina contains the bankers uh, who own the banks in Zurich and Basel uh, who pretty much control European finance. And there's as many conspiracy theories about the Grand Loge Alpina over in Europe as there are about the uh, Bohemian Club over here. These are the richest people in Europe and they belong to the secret Masonic group, the Grand Loge Alpina. Harold Wilson, no relative, he was a prime minister in England back before Thatcher, if anybody can remember what time before <laughs> Thatcher, way back in the dark ages there, the 70s. Mm -hmm. Harold Wilson called them the Gnomes of Zurich. As far as I know, he was the only one that ever pronounced the G in Gnomes. <laughs> <laughs> we called them the Gnomes of Zurich. He complained that no matter what any government in Europe tried to do, if the Gnomes of Zurich didn't like it, they'd stop it one way or another. And as a matter of fact, governments don't act. Governments only react. The bankers make the decisions, and then governments decide how are we going to adjust to this. Government can't do anything unless a bank gives them the money to do it. And if the, uh, the bank says, we'll give you this much money for building armaments, the government will build armaments because they can't get any money out of the bankers any other way. If the banks say, we don't want you to build armaments anymore, we want you to build highways, they'll build highways. So people will wonder or worry about who's president, whether it's Bush or Quail or, or a pubic hair or, or anus or whatever. The, the important thing is who's running the banks. They're the ones who are making the decisions. Anyway, the Grand Loge Alpina was distributing this uh, literature from the Priory of Science, which said on the inside of the front cover that it was published by the Committee to Secure the Rights and Liberties of Low-Cost Housing. <laughs> Uh, Matthew Pauli, the Swiss journalist, got interested in the Committee to Secure the Rights and Privileges of Low-Cost Housing because he detected in the Priory of Science publications that there was something that was not exactly centered on low-cost housing. There seemed to be a strong implication that there were superhuman beings in Europe who were waiting for their turn to take over and solve all of our problems for us. Uh, Pauli started investigating and he found that there was the uh, circuit was not published by the Committee to Secure the Rights and Privileges of Low-Cost Housing. It was published out of the office of the Committee of Public Safety of the De Gaulle government in Paris, which was run by André Malraux, great novelist and art historian, and Pierre Plantard, uh, the St. Clair, who uh, is related to the St. Clairs of Scotland, who have been connected with Mason recents about the 13th century, and played a major role in the development of uh, European Masonry. And it turns out that Pierre Plantard de St. Clair is the, was then the Grand Master of the Priory of Science. 
uh, Pauli decided that the priory of Sion was a conspiracy within the de Gaulle government intended to restore monarchy in France and perhaps establish a Europe-wide empire with one emperor at the top like Napoleon had tried to do. A year after this book was published, Pauli was shot as a spy in Israel. That must be a coincidence. <laughs> A magazine, a French magazine, uh, <coughs> after these three books came out, a French magazine whose name I don't remember, but you can look it up in Holy Blood, Holy Grail, they did their own study of the Priory of Sion, and they, did, they claimed that Archbishop Lefebvre was the head of it. Now, Archbishop Lefebvre was the guy who, for about 20 years, was going around denouncing the Vatican claiming the Vatican had been taken over by Freemasons and Satanists during the reign of Pope John XXIII, and that the Catholic Church was now totally corrupted by Masonic and Satanic influences, and his followers often added to that, he is the man who should be Pope. He never said that himself explicitly, but that's a strong feature in all propaganda put out by Lefebvre groups. They, they put an ad that I mentioned, uh, this ad that was in the Los Angeles paper, I think I mentioned it uh, earlier today. A couple of weeks ago in the L.A. Times, there was an ad that said, Jesus and Mary predict huge earthquake for L.A. And this ad explained that Los Angeles is going to have a bigger earthquake than you had up here, much bigger. And the only way to survive is by hanging a crucifix on your door, buying a rosary, and getting a copy of the Catholic Bible translated before 1965. That's, uh, that's before Vatican II. Uh, this is a key thing with the Lefebvre people, is that everything since 1965, everything that's come out of the Vatican since 1965 has been the work of Freemasons and Satanists. And Lefebvre is the only one who's maintaining the true Catholic Church. And he got away with this for over 20 years. Last year they abruptly excommunicated him. For years I was wondering, why don't they excommunicate this guy? <laughs> I mean, he's marching up and down Europe, as it were. He's publishing all. He's got all these followers putting out all these hysterical publications announcing the Vatican is run by Satanists, and they and they just ignore him. Well, after 20 years, they stopped ignoring him and they excommunicated him, which means that he got more publicity and more followers. Naturally, maybe that's why it took them so long to excommunicate him. He's got a group in Long Island called Our Lady of the Flowers. If you write to them, you will get two rose petals blessed by Jesus Christ himself and a lot of propaganda about why Jesus wants you to kill homosexuals. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is really pissed at the gay men. He's got a real thing. He's off his head on the subject. That's why he's sending the fucking earthquake. <laughs> That's, well, this is what the Lefebvre people believe. One of his disciples... Father Lone Cron, who was, as uh, a matter of fact, ordained by Lefebvre himself, he tried to shoot the Pope in Fatima a couple of years ago. Bang, 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 and he missed. Uh, well, priests are not trained. Uh, he, said, he said at his trial that, uh, in cross examination, the uh, prosecutor said, You show no remorse whatsoever. Do you feel no sense of guilt? And he said, I have absolutely no guilt about trying to kill the Antichrist. My only guilt is that I committed some sins of the flesh when I was younger. <laughs> He's guilty about that 20 years later. He doesn't mind like shooting somebody. <laughs> In uh, 1981 appeared Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which at last revealed the actual truth. <laughs> <laughs> the Priory of Sion is a medieval chivalric letter devoted to protecting the descendants of the Merovingian dynasty. And the reason they are being protected against the continuous attempts of the Vatican to get rid of them all it is not that they are descended from people from Sirius, but that they are descended from Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. 
Jesus and Mary Magdalene had a son named Merove who emigrated to France and the Amerovingian dynasty is descended from him. And as a matter of fact, Holy Blood, Holy Grail gives you genealogies of all sorts of people descended from Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, including Otto von Habsburg. Now, Otto von Habsburg was one of the founders of the Bilderbergers. I trust you're you're paying paying close attention at this point. It gets a bit hairy around here. Uh, The Bilderbergers, uh, originally sponsored by Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, who's also on the charts in Holy Blood, Holy Grail. He's also descended from Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene, if you believe this theory. Prince Bernhardt founded the Bilderbergers. Otto von Habsburg has been the chief financier behind it. Otto von Habsburg's grandfather gave several million francs to the priest who built that weird church of Mary Magdalene in Rennes le Chateau with the sign over the door saying, this place is terrible and the brick in the cellar that will let you down to the center of hollow earth, if you believe the other story. Now I have a friend who was over in Rennes Chateau last year, and he found a hollow statue in the church. He was looking around to see how many mysteries he could solve. He found this, this is hollow, by God. None of the other investigators have discovered this. I found something on my own. He managed to get the statue open and unscrewed. And inside were some German newspapers from 1904 that have absolutely no relation to any of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, uh, I'm going to tell you, one of the grand masters of the Priory of Science in the 1960s was uh, Jean Cocteau, uh, who was also one of the founders of the Surrealist Movement, the biggest opium head in France, uh, experimented with peyote also, uh, he, uh, uh, there's a movie Cocteau made with BBC called Portrait of a Poet and Cocteau insisted on being in on the editing he was not, it was not just about him he wanted it to have his own style there's a scene in there of Cocteau coming out of his house and a policeman stops him asks him a couple of questions and then lets him walk on and on the soundtrack he hear Cocteau's voice saying the poet must always be a suspicious character the authorities must always worry what he is hatching. <laughs> That's why they have public schools, remember? <laughs> Make sure nobody's hatching anything. <laughs> and we're all just repeating like parrots. Um, my beautiful wife, Arlen, uh, has read some of this literature, not as much as I have, but I keep here waving these books at her and say, Jesus Christ, look at this. Isn't this, this kind of, what do you think about this? <laughs> and she looked to Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and said, oh, it's obvious. I can see it. 1932, a cellar in Paris. Cocteau, Dali, André Breton, <laughs> uh, all bunch, they're all sitting around smoking opium. And one of them says, you know, surrealism has pretty much had it. People are getting bored. We can't revive that. Uh, what are we going to do? And Cocteau takes a long toke. <laughs> Let's overthrow the Catholic Church. <laughs> well, that's Arlen's theory. <laughs> but the, the priory of science can be proven to be older than Cocteau. It goes back at least to the 1890s and probably a couple of centuries before that. Maybe back to the 13th century even, like they claim. There's recently been a book by a Jungian psychologist uh, named Ian Begg <clears throat> called The Cult of the Black Virgin. At least one of these books is actually here to show you I'm not making all this up as I go along. <laughs> oh, here's Holy Blood, Holy Grail. So, Ian Begg uh, made a study of the 400 and uh, something more than 400 statues in European churches of the Virgin Mary, in which the Virgin Mary appears to be black or Negro. Now, if if these statues all appeared in the last 40 or 60 years, you might make a good case uh, of attributing them to the Rastafarians. (laughs) The Rastafarians believed that Jesus and his whole family were black. They also believed all the heroes of the Old Testament were black. They got some good biblical references to back this, if you believe that black in the King James Version means black racially. Uh, depends on, there's room for interpretation. But the Rastafarians did not do this. These statues have been there for 700 years. 
Most of them can be definitely dated to the 13th century. So who did it? Well, according to Ian Begg, the Priory of Sion did it. For some reason, in the 13th century, they went all over Europe planting statues to indicate that the, the, house of the, the House of David was black, or at least part of it was black by the time it got to Jesus anyway. Why did they do this? Well, maybe, maybe it was true. Uh, if you take a look at the map, the Near East and Africa are pretty close. There must have been a lot of genetic drift back and forth. Read some of the Rastafarian literature. They'll convince you. They, make, they, they have a lot of good... Ian Begg doesn't go into that. He says black is a symbol of the supreme mystical state. Uh, only the ignorant Buddhists think white light represents the supreme mystical state. The Sufis know that above the white light there's the trance of total blackness, which is the highest trance of all, and reveals the true nature of everything, which Alistair Crowley described as nothing. The true nature of everything is nothing. <laughs> that is the negative void. You think of a positive void it is endless whiteness. you got to think of it as endless blackness to get the negative void, the capitalistic zero, and that's the true essence of everything according to the Sufi tradition and according to Alistair Crowley, who, by the way, was associated with the priest who built that church in Rendle Chateau and says this place is terrible and has the Scotchman in kilts at the crucifixion. <laughs> yeah, Crowley learned magic from the Gregor Mather, Mathers, who uh, was a Scotchman who uh, claimed his family had been Freemasons since the days of the Knights Templar and that he was the reincarnation of King James II. Uh, the last Scotch king of England. But that's more or less a digression. Don't let it confuse you. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. <laughs> the, uh, Ian Beck, yeah, the cult of the Black Virgin. Uh, the Priory of Science put these statues all over here. In fact, there's one in Dublin. Uh, Our Lady of Dublin is black. I've actually seen her. And like all the other black virgins around Europe, she was lost and refound. Almost every one of these black statues, there's a legend about how she got lost and then miraculously was recovered. A lady of Dublin was found in a blacksmith's yard after being lost for 200 years. <laughs> Genesis. Uh, this fellow studies the geometry of that church in Renle Chateau in relation to the geometry of the surrounding area. You see, he manages to make pentagons. He manages to make spirals. All sorts of interesting patterns. Yeah, there's, this is the one he calls the vagina of Nuit. Nuit was the Egyptian star goddess. Uh, this illustrates the first law of uh, lay hunters which is that any group of churches and prehistoric megaliths can be connected into an interesting geometrical pattern <laughs> if you use a small enough map and a thick enough pencil. <laughs> he uses a small enough map and a thick enough pencil to get the most interesting diagrams I've ever seen in any of these lay hunting books. And he proves, once he's got his diagrams of the relation of the church to the prehistoric megaliths uh, and various stars, he proves that France was settled by people from Atlantis. When Atlantis sank, some of the survivors got to France, and they kept alive the tradition of how the human race was created. The human race was created by an extraterrestrial named Satan. Satan was not an angel at all. He was an extraterrestrial. And we've all got his genetic strain. So we are all children of Satan. <laughs> and once we recognize that, we will be liberated and ready for the next revelation from outer space. Now, you've got to admit. <laughs> you've got to admit. <laughs> some people are stupid, some people are batshit crazy, and some are just full of shit. You've got to admit, this is much better bullshit than you get from Ramtha. <laughs> Ramtha has been dead 40,000 years and hasn't had an original thought at all that time. <laughs> You can't get anything from Ramp that you can't get from Hallmark reading cards. <laughs> well, or the editorials in Reader's Digest. This stuff is original and provocative. This stuff might actually come from extraterrestrials. At least it shows a, a, a rather uh, transhuman sense of humor. 
and a definite attempt to adjust our minds in such a way that we are no longer sure that we fully understand the difference between poetry and reality, which is another reason for suspecting Cocteau was the main architect. Uh, but this, this, this does enlarge the mind, liberate the energies, and create an acute case of paranoia when you trace all the people on that the Merovingian chart, like Otto von Habsburg is the president of the Society for the United States of Europe. They've been working for decades to create a united Europe, which is about to appear. Just when they're about to do it, the whole Eastern Bloc breaks loose from Russia. Why did Gorbachev let them break loose? Who's dealing with who behind the scenes? What has this got to do with the gnomes of Zurich? <laughs> they put up the financing before any major political change can occur. What has this got to do with the pay do group in Italy? Pay do was using the Vatican Bank to launder most of the cocaine money from South America and most of the heroin money from the Near East. The heroin money came by way of the Grey Wolves, one of whom, Mehmet, Mali, uh, Mehmet Ali Aja, ran the money through the Banco Ambrosiano in Milan, which was owned by the Vatican Bank. He tried to shoot the Pope, remember, in St. Peter's Square? It's funny how many people try to kill this Pope. It's like a mafia family, isn't it? Uh, I tell you what, I think it's time we have a break. Everybody get up, stretch, go outside, get some fresh air. And then I'll continue with uh, the Pei Due story. You know, it's connections with George Bush. And well, well. All right. <laughs> Some people, uh, you know, have been asking me just this morning while I was signing notes with some other people, and it got a bit chaotic, but it did uh, suggest to me that people have a lot of questions. Now, I have to leave at 8.30, because I have to catch a plane. So, I think I'll put the question, I think I will put a question period in here, and if things work out, okay, I'll put another question period in just before I leave. After I go through the Vatican Bank, I don't know, okay, the center of the ocean, and all the bones, and so on. But right now, those of you who are absolutely desperate to ask questions, is your chance. Yes? Um, the availability of the full star? Uh, the full star, uh, the inventor died. Uh, it is now being manufactured under the name New Star. And I have not got the uh, manufacturer's address memorized. You will have to start out with that full new star and wrap it down with yourself. It's the best I can do. Yes. Being you were once an editor of Playboy, having comments on Hugh's recent marriage? <laughs> Boy, that's tenuous. <laughs> Seeing as I once lived in Chicago, do I have any comments on the current mayor? Uh, son of Richard Daly. It sounds like the greatest horror movie ever. <laughs> I had enough of Richard Daly in the 60s. You have to, so you have to get married. Uh, I can't think of a damn comment to make about it. Well, I have what I said before about the environment. You mentioned in your book, uh, except on the shelf, how you triggered it. You know. More, more, at least we're looking into the, the new technologies. Is it worth it anymore? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it ever was. If it ever was, it still is. It depends on what your picture of the future is. Yeah. And my picture of the future is uh, uh, uninhibitedly optimistic. I think we're in a period of fractal chaos in which the whole, whole system is uh, collapsing and uh, every week is a new surprise, like they just let Nelson Mandela out of South Africa. Yeah. And in Romania, the most terrible of all the dictatorships, they killed the, the dictator and his wife and then passed the law against capital punishment and didn't let it go on. Like it does in most revolutions, executions upon executions until they create a counter-revolutionary class out of the relatives of all the people who got killed. Uh, and uh, four people have been found guilty of genocide and sentenced to life in prison instead of being executed. That's a real surprise in the history of revolutions. And uh, we're getting one surprise after another. 
And I think this is the period of fractal chaos in which the old system is uh, giving way to the new system. Of course, uh, fractal chaos has backward as well as forward movements. And right now, right now in Southern California, where I live, they're conducting the biggest experiment ever conducted on human beings since Nazi Germany. <laughs> Uh, I, I have strong suspicions that Dr. Mengler has taken over the state of California. <laughs> and they are dumping malathion on people every night down there just to see what happens. If enough of us survive, they'll have scientific proof that it's safe. Now, right now, they don't have any, they only have proof that people can survive one dose. They have no proof that people can survive repeated doses. So if enough of us survive, they'll have proof. If enough of us don't survive, they'll say, oh, well, gee, I guess we fucked up again. (laughs) What do you expect the government (laughs) sitting (laughs) here? Yes? Given the situation in Russia, do you suspect that the Kremlin has been infiltrated by this audience? (laughs) Uh, In a sense, um, Bucky Fuller, said in 1981 that the, uh, the technologists are going to take over Russia and their attitude is nobody can win a nuclear war so the first thing to do is to abolish the possibility of nuclear war and then introduce uh, the uh, western style bourgeois freedoms that the communists have always rejected because scientists need that for their work. And, of course, Gorbachev was a good friend of Sakharov, and Gorbachev does get a lot of support from that part of Russian society. So it's sort of a techno, it's a technocratic revolution, but uh, technocrats tend to be discordians anyway, so to overlap. Yes? What's the origin of the word Fedor? I would get out of here alive if I told you. I'll quote you from the Gospel of Thomas, which is the earliest of all Gospels, earlier than any that got into the Bible. It's dated, uh, it's probably written right after the death of uh, the late Redeemer, and uh, probably by his twin brother. At least according to one version, uh, Thomas means twin. Uh, It says the Gospel of uh, Judah, Thomas. And uh, that probably means Judah, the brother, the the twin brother. Uh, Or at least that's one interpretation of it. In there, um, Jesus uh, tells something to Thomas. And the other apostles say, what did he whisper to you that he didn't want the rest of us to hear? And Thomas said, if I told you, you would pick up stones and kill me. Next question. (laughs) Uh, You already had a question. Uh, You've made a lot of very optimistic predictions in the past. Uh, A lot of people seem to have predictions about the time frame of the changes that we seem to be in. Do you have a a latest prediction uh, regarding the time frame? And to quote Robert Heinlein, it does not pay a profit to be too specific. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, things have been happening so fast lately. When I started, I did a European tour in November. When I started the tour, people were saying the Berlin Wall is going to come down within 10 years. When I finished the tour, people were saying, which week will it be? When I got back here, the wall came down already. I got a piece of the wall on my mantelpiece sent to me by a friend in Berlin. Things are happening so fast that the only prediction I'll make is that everything is going to happen faster than we expected. <coughs> okay, any more questions? Yes? Where is Gregory Hill and what's he up to? Uh, uh, Gregory Hill is the head of a large computer facility uh, owned by one of the largest banks in the United States. He's not writing anymore, running this big computer uh complex is keeping him busy enough and he's still the same whimsical surrealist character which makes me wonder what's happening to the banking system (laughs) (laughs) Kerry Thornley Uh, Kerry Thornley is still sending out uh, long uh, documents explaining that he killed John Kennedy while under hypnosis by the CIA and I was his CIA babysitter and I only deny it because all CIA agents deny what they did. (laughs) (laughs) And I thank him for the publicity. (laughs) 
make Russell charge the conspiracy digest that I am a paid agent of the Rockefeller conspiracy. <laughs> and the next issue of conspiracy digest, I confess that it was true. Nelson, uh, I mean David. Uh, I, I, I said Nelson because when Illuminatus first came out, I was disappointed that Dell wasn't doing enough advertising and I didn't have a budget myself. So I figured, what can I afford to do? So I had a rubber stamp made. And I put it on all my letters and wherever I went, if I, I wasn't a cop looking, I put it on the billboard, I put it on toilet paper and men's <laughs> room and movie theaters. Everywhere I went, I put this rubber stamp that said, why is Nelson Rockefeller never seen in public without his trousers? Read Illuminatus. <laughs> that would arouse a lot of curiosity. This goes to show artists never understand the depth of their own inspiration or how the collective unconscious works, because when Nelson Rockefeller died, he didn't have his trousers on, as you may remember. Anyway, I, uh, in my confession, in Conspiracy Digest, I said May Russell was right. David Rockefeller comes around every week and gives me a bar of solid gold, and my whole cellar is stacked from floor to ceiling with these bars of Rockefeller gold. And then I ended woof, woof, woof. And I'm sure, knowing May, she was going around showing that letter to people for years, saying, here, he confessed, he it. and he even gives away his extraterrestrial origin. He gets virus with a dog star in there. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we will now continue with the evening's entertainment. And I hope you find as many yaks in the second part as you found in the first part. <laughs> uh, during World War II, a young Italian named Vicio Gelli managed to uh, get himself a position in the communist underground in Italy and a job with the Gestapo at the same time. You will already see that Mr. Jelly was uh, good at uh, fancy footwork. He managed to go through the whole war uh, working for the underground and the Gestapo simultaneously, persuading each side that he was betraying the other and actually loyally serving them. Uh, a lot of people went to their deaths because Jelly turned them into the Gestapo. A lot of people did not go to their deaths because Jelly did not turn them into the Gestapo. There was some attempt to bring him to trial as a war criminal at the end of the war, but this was stopped by the numbers of people who came forth and said he helped the underground more than anybody in Italy, so he got off scot-free. He thereupon went to work set up an office in Rome with a couple of friends who were expert forgers and created an alternative ID for uh, not wanted Nazi war criminals, most of whom went to Latin America, and Jelly later got them jobs with American intelligence there, among them was Cross Barbie, whom you may have heard of. Uh, Jelly pretty soon staffed uh, the Latin American branch of the CIA with uh, Nazi war criminals, uh, one or two of whom gets caught every year, and the CIA always throws up their hands and say, we didn't know he was a Nazi war criminal, we thought he just looked like that Nazi war criminal. Uh, Jelly uh, officially went to work for the CIA in the 1950s. He was working out of the American Embassy in Rome, according to quite a few witnesses. Uh, one of his first major jobs for the CIA was turning the Italian labor movement away from the left-wing direction it was taking after World War II in a right-wing direction. He accomplished this by a variety of means, one of which was persuading Sophia Loren to star in a television commercial denouncing the left-wing unions and telling everybody to join the right-wing unions, for which Sophia got paid a pretty penny. A pile of lira. Like I told you, you can get movie stars to say anything these <laughs> days. Uh, that didn't pull the, that didn't exactly turn the tide all by itself. So Jelly hired a bunch of his friends in the mafia to shoot all the uh, heads of the left-wing labor unions in Italy uh, who wouldn't take bribes or take uh, more right-wing positions. And so the CIA was very delighted with Mr. Jelly, and he became one of their major European uh, assets, as they say, just like Noriega in Panama, uh, major asset. Around this time, Jelly was uh, recruited by the KGB. 
Uh, well, why not? If you, uh, if you can convince the Nazis and the communists you're on the same side during World War II, you can convince the CIA and the <laughs> communists you're upon by their side during the Cold War. So he was receiving uh, payments from the KGB and the CIA for a variety of projects when he entered the Grand Orient Lodge of Egyptian Freemasonry. The Grand Orient Lodge of Egyptian Freemasonry was founded in 1771 by the Duc de Orléans, and who had ambitions of becoming king. Uh, Orléans knew that if the right seven people died at the right time, he would succeed to being king. It was just a question of persuading these seven people to die at the right times. <laughs> and uh, as some Italian Renaissance prince victim know that he is pushed by a friend, it is only important that he is dead. <laughs> uh, there were some Italians who felt that you had to know a friend was doing it to you when it happened. To them. Uh, the, the, uh, well, to get into the subtleties of the Roman psyche is a little, <laughs> it goes a little too deep. But you got to read the Maltese for alchemists. But, well, anyway, uh, Orleon uh, was uh, assisted in founding the Grand Orient Lodge by Count Cagliostro, who, as everybody knows, was actually a Sicilian gypsy named Joseph Balsamo. Everybody knows that who hasn't read Charles Floyd and Colin Wilson both of whom have pointed out that the identification of Cagliostro with Balsamo was made by one witness, was never proved, and had just been repeated by historians because nobody knows who he really was. And most historians go on the principle that you can find one source that says something and all the other sources don't know anything, we'll just repeat this. Nobody actually knows who Cagliostro was or where he came from except that he seemed to belong to every secret society in Europe, had all their insignias on his robes, knew all their secret grips and passwords, and had a hell of a lot of money, which he distributed in poor neighborhoods all over France while he was doing miracle healings using mesmerism. <coughs> and the Grand Orient Lodge became the biggest Masonic lodge in pre-revolutionary France, and the leaders of the Grand Orient Lodge all ended up the leaders of the new government after the revolution, except for Orléans, who got his head chopped off, which illustrates Wilson's first law of conspiracies. The greatest conspirators are usually the greatest fuck-ups. Orléans did not get what he wanted. He got his head chopped off instead. Cagliostro died in a dungeon in Rome, awaiting trial by the Inquisition. Uh, the Grand Orient Lodge was involved in quite a lot of radical activity through the 19th century, including the Paris Commune of the 1870s. When uh, Jelly entered the Grand Orient Lodge, he ascended to the third degree, which is pretty low, uh, comparatively speaking, because there are 32 degrees. After attaining the third degree, learning the identity of the widow's son, and uh, that of which it is wisest not to speak. Uh, Jelly founded uh, Propaganda Due, which was named after Propaganda Uno, which was a Masonic socialist conspiracy of the 1870s. Except Propaganda Due, unlike Propaganda Uno, was not a socialist conspiracy, it was a fascist conspiracy. He rec recruited most of the remaining fascists in Italy. Uh, <coughs> and then set about recruiting everybody in a position of power. One of the rules of propaganda due was that you had to write out in handwriting, not on typewriter, you had to write in your own handwriting and give to the Grand Master of the Lodge, Michio Jelly, a complete confession of all your crimes and sins, everything illegal and unethical you had ever done. And because Propaganda Due had acquired the reputation of being the people who were getting into power in Italy, a lot of people wanted to join. So they wrote out these confessions, and this gave Jelly ample opportunity to blackmail people who didn't want to join Pay Due. He called them up and told them what he had in his files, saying, unless you join 